我是郭老师的某一个学生。好，今天要跟你们分享是我翻译的小故事，叫做《长头发姑娘》。嗯，So I'll be sharing with you my translated version of Rapunzel。嗯，我选了，呃，我选翻译这个故事是因为我喜欢迪士尼发的很受欢迎的一部电影，叫做《Tangled <咳>好那从前有一对夫妇他们一直想生一个孩子但没有如愿妇人只能希望上天上天实现他的愿望这对夫妇的宅子后面有扇窗面向的一个一个壮丽花园里面长了满长满了最漂亮的花草不过大家都害怕拿管这花园的可怕女尸这女尸筑起了环绕花园的高墙没有人敢进入有一天这女子站在窗边她看到下面的花园一块栽种了最艳丽的金花的花骨这话儿如此先艳惹得他特别想尝尝花的味道随着时间的推移他越望越来越迫切丈夫很爱着妻子他想不管怎样我宁可冒险采一些花送给妻子也不要让他死去这天夜晚他就翻下高墙潜入了花花园很快的摘了一些花而回来送给妻子妻子拿了拿到鲜花就马上做了一碗沙拉把它吃掉了他觉得真美味真是美味于是第二天他想他想再再尝到呃鲜花的渴望又增长
的歌声，就停下脚步，仔细聆听。聆听时候，看到巫师走进高塔，高高叫起来：“罗胖子，罗胖子，放下你的头发来！”借着罗胖子的头发，从高塔上的窗户放下来，巫师就爬上去了。看到这个场景，王子说：“如果这就是爬上去的方法的话，我也会试一下。”隔天晚上，他来到高高塔边，喊道：“罗胖子，罗胖子，放下你的头发来！”果然，头发立刻就放下来了。王子爬爬了上去。一开始，因为啊，罗胖子从从来没有看过男子，他害怕极了。但王子，呃，开始，开始像好朋友一样跟他讲话。王子跟他说，呃，他的心被感动了，他必须来看看，看看看他。罗胖子的恐惧就消失了。然后王子问他，要不要嫁嫁给他？罗胖子同意了，把手放在王子手中，说我愿意跟他一起走。不过我不知道怎么离开这里。你以后每次时每次来时，带上一团一团丝线，我会用这丝线结成一条绳梯。等时机到了，我可以我可以下去的时候，我你就用马载我回去。他们决定，决定他们每天晚上来。他，他们决定他每天晚上来，这样可以避免碰到白天来的巫师。巫师好一阵子都没发现罗胖子与王子的计划，直到有一天，罗胖子不小心的问巫师：“老太婆，你为什么比王子更难拉上来呢？他一下子就会被拉上来。”巫师见见声说：“啊，你这个坏孩子！什么？我以为我已经把你和所有的人隔开了，但但是我看得出来，我受骗了。”愤怒的巫师就剪掉了罗胖子的头发，美丽的发辫掉了在地上。巫师无情地把罗胖子带到沙漠里。让他在悲伤和痛苦中生活。就在当天，巫师也在窗户外的狗子上绕好了罗胖子的头发，想要欺骗王子。果然，过了一会儿，王子来了。他说：“罗胖子，罗胖子，放下你的头发来。”巫师就放下来已经被剪掉的头发。王子爬上了。爬上去了，他没有找到他最亲爱的朋友，却亲眼看到了用生气而邪恶的眼光注视着他的巫师。巫师嘲弄地对王子说：“你想找到是你的客人，可是这鸟儿已经被猫骑走了。”猫。猫还会把你的眼睛，你的眼睛抓害的。可胖子对于你来说已经死了，你永远不会看到他。王子感到万分痛苦，在绝望中，他从高塔，呃，高塔里跳跳了下去。虽然他得以逃逃逃生，呃，他以后他的眼睛却被高塔下的。金瓷，呃，荆棘刺伤了，之后他的眼睛失明了，失明，在森林里游荡，只是吃吃吃些根茎和浆果果腹，整天悲喊流泪，难过自己失去了最爱的妻子，他这样悲苦的。飘荡了好几年，来到了 Rapunzel 艰难度日的沙漠。他听到了一个一个热视的声音，就向着向着声音的方向走去。当王子走去走上
前十就放着认出了他抱着王子哭了起来当他的泪滴润泽了王子的眼睛结果他的眼睛回复了明亮他们回到王子的国度快乐地一起生活了很久很久整整十分钟很厉害好我们请第二位好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好好
Since then, the load grandfather carried increased substantially, as he now had to look after two families, his father's family and his uncle's family. Early in the mornings, when it was still dark, he would walk the mountain road to neighboring villages in search of odd jobs. By nightfall, he would finish his work, count his income, and return home in the moonlight. There were the, these were the years that Grandpa was called to be a part-time worker. He spent his days on these seasonal jobs, earning, earning his living, while his mother stayed at home, sewing clothes. When Grandpa turned 15, a man and his two children moved into the village, and through a combination of strange events, married gra- Grandpa's mother. This is where Grandpa's third father came in, his stepfather, along with his new sister and brother. Grandfather's, grandfather's uh, father's third father was quite eccentric and odd, but Grandpa knew he was a learned man, however, when he heard him speak. He was a successful candidate in the imperial examinations his time. <laughs> and except for literary poetry and writing, he was well-researched in astronomy and geography both. You'd often see him at night, sitting under the eaves of the house, with several children gathered around him, sharing the contents of a book, and on those clear nights he would lead them to the stars. Grandpa's brothers were not so literate, which sadly eventually led to my uncle's learning how to smoke. The days gradually whisked by, and life became more stable, and Grandpa and his several siblings grew their families. Their stepfather also enjoyed peaceful and tranquil days watching his children and grandchildren grow, and he slowly became older and older as the years went by too. His life became less happy in his older years as more children came. Grandpa's stepfather would take turns eating food at different children's houses, where everyone was treated fairly. But when he would go walking in the mountains when he was bored, his children worried that with his old age he might not notice and unexpectedly slip and fall, and no one would know. These kids did not give him a kind face about this. One day, stepfather broke open and told his children that they need not worry. (laughs) He told them, don't worry about paying for my grave. I will pay everything, and I'll be buried on the north side of the East Mountain, underneath (laughs) the big pine tree. You don't even have to pay for a single rock. (laughs) These words were particularly hard for Grandpa and his siblings. So they did not stop him, and they let him roam the mountains freely. Not many years later, Stepfather died at the age of 80. It was said of him before he was buried that He was a well-accomplished astrologer and geographer, Mm -hmm. and this wasn't even all of it. Much more was said of him. After he died, Grandpa found the tree on the north side of the mountain and buried him underneath the big pine tree. As they were digging the spot for his burial, they found the perfect amount of blocks to make his grave with. Mm -hmm. What are the chances? (laughs) After Grandpa's stepfather died, Grandpa began, began reading the almanac. Probably because of, because of his stepfather's influence, and maybe because he wanted to respect it. Regarding he never listened well to his teachings when he was on the earth. Grandpa never learned formally. He only learned while at his stepfather's side. He learned a few words from him, and afterwards wanted to go to school and learn formally. But it was sad he was so old now. It would cost Grandpa an entire bag of rice to, to attend school. But even this they didn't have. Even if you have the heart to learn, you don't always have the energy or resources to do to do so. <laughs> After many years passed by, Grandpa slowly started to let his children take charge of their own lives. He knew he was growing older, and so let them go and take care of family matters on their own. Every day he would lead the ox to the mountainside to eat, and then he would go and drink water until the ox was full. Then he'd grab the ox, turn around, and come home. Grandpa had a temperament much like that of his several brothers, and the village folks said it was exactly like their stepfather's. Grandpa would uh, sometimes rip one good to the ox when it didn't want to listen to him. But Grandpa was different around the village folk. He had a much better, better attitude. In the village, Grandpa was known for seeing the most things in his life experiencing the most things, and also witnessing all the changes that took place in the village. He even helped establish 
established many of the early houses in the village, including putting on the roof tiles to the original houses. Grandpa put all of his energy and dedication into this village. In those many years, Grandpa walked many roads, but his road still continues on. And as with Grandpa these days, only the ox accompanies him, along with the eastern mountain's red sun and Grandpa's shadow, alone in the cold, cold air. Excellent timing. Excellent timing. Great storytelling voice. Great voice. Okay. Excellent. All right. My name is Aaron Hall. I'm logged in, and I decided to focus my research project on dialogue. And so Mm -hmm. what I decided to translate was a movie script. And the movie I decided to pick was Casablanca, because it has, to me, the the (laughs) classier lines. And so what I I decided to present was I took a short clip, and as they'll say their English phrase, and I'll pause it, and I'll say what I translated into Chinese. So here we go. Sensei no, not me, Grandpa. Good. 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 The car drive all night. We'll get drunk. We'll go fishing and stay away until she's got home. We'll go fishing and stay away until she's got home. We'll go fishing and stay away until she's got home. We'll go fishing and stay away until she's got home. We'll go fishing and stay away until she's got home. We'll go fishing and stay away until she's got home. We'll go fishing and stay away until she's got home. We'll go fishing and stay away until she's got home. We'll go fishing and stay away until she's got home. We'll go fishing and stay away until she's got home. We'll go fishing and stay away until she's got home. We'll go fishing and stay away until she's got home. We'll go fishing and stay away until she's got home. Who got it and she walks in. You know, where it goes, one end, one out. Tom and Jolly, who got our tie, Raho, Tajo Tima, Zeron Fatsa, New York City. My watch stopped. Will it show you a thing there? I bet they're asleep in New York. I bet they're asleep all over America. Will you get a new year there and don't say that? Jenga may go eating those say that. All the gin joints in all the towns in all the world. She walks in the mind. This world has so many cities, so many clubs. She walks into my clubs. Oh, she walks into my clubs. Oh, that's your plane. What are you playing? Oh, just a little song. Oh, that's just a little song. Oh, 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 just a little song. Play it for her, play it for me. Well, I don't think I can remember. I can't stand it, I can't. She walks in the mind. 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 She walks in the Yes. 
skip ahead a little bit to start scrimming and see. Who After we finish all five presentations, we'll have more Q&A. I know that uh, each presenter has done substantial translations, um, but to accommodate time management, we have cut, cut, cut down some material and highlighted the most uh, you know, uh, grabbing, <laughs> grabbing materials to attract to our audience. Okay, uh, I think next one is our fourth presenter presentation by uh, by Robert and Joshua and they are presenting modern Chinese poetry okay by Audi and Zhong Ding Wen how welcome Come, yeah please okay so I'm presenting on um, some poetry that I translate from Chinese to English by oh that's not it <laughs> There we go. Um, Zhong Dingwen was a well-known Taiwanese poet. He was born in uh, Shucheng County in the province of Anhui in mainland China on April 29, 1914. In March 1954, he and several other poets established the Blue Star Poet Society. He published numerous poetry anthologies and also served as an official during the Republican era in China. On August 12, 2012, Zhong Dingwen passed away from heart failure in Taipei. Mm -hmm. and, uh, as long as time allows me to read both Chinese and English. Mm -hmm. so. You're good. Uh, first poem is uh, Feng Yi Huang Shan Xing, or in English, A Hike on Mount Huang in the Wind and Rain. Yi Nian the Shan Feng Sa Sa, Yi Nian the Shan Yi Meng Meng, Yi Nian the Shan Se, Chan Zhe Shu Zhe, Ru Meng the You Mei, Chang Cui Er Man Meng, San Shi Liao Feng, Hai Zai, Shui Nian Zhong, Mao Zhe, Yi Nian the Shan Yi, 迎着一面的山峰 Mountain wind in my face, howling Mountain rain in my face, drizzling Mountain hues before me, mingling With the hues of daybreak as if it were a dream serenely hidden, verdant and hazy, thirty-six peaks, all still asleep. Braving the rain head-on, pushing against the gusts of wind, I walk between hills and headlands, alone in the wind and rain, suddenly feeling this winding mountain path leading me into the paintings of Mifu. Second poem's Chiao, or Bridge. Zai Huang Kuo Da, Hui Bai Su Da, 天后宫桥下是着坚固的响应而不足地点情让时间带起我们的往日地恋吧让时间带起我们的还了
以苦恼报，在实践的上面，是这有救的生命，立者，凭空的立者，如下石桥。Below the wide ashgray Tianhou Palace Bridge, the languid Suzhou River meanders on. Beneath our solitary lives, time grows weary, drifting away. Days like water flow by, flow by. You could not ask which are happy, which are sad. What remains is this stable life, crossing over time, like this bridge, like this bridge, casting a shadow on the surface of the water. Our lives also cast their dark souls. Alas, the shadow of life floating on the river of time, following the river's rapids, always changing its shape. Let time wash away our love for days gone by. Let time carry away our happiness and sadness. Crossing over time, this life endures. Crossing over, crossing over without a foundation, just like this bridge. Thank you. Excellent. The second part of this presentation is by Joshua Lin. Okay. Uh, 你好，我叫李美坚。啊啊，我准备好了一一首呃诗歌，就叫《狂人日记》。呃，黄人日记就是敖迪写的。敖迪是一个现代中国诗人。对。呃，可是因为我不想花太多时间，<笑>我只会呃念我自己翻译的英文。对。可是我会把呃中文呃原文呃原文放在这边，所以。你可以看一下。So my name is、uh, Joshua Lin, and I am. I've prepared a small poem called "Diary of a Madman," as you can see.、Um, so this poem was written by a Chinese poet, Ao Di.、Um, he is a modern Chinese poet,、mm -hmm. and Uh, for the sake of time, though, I am just going to read my English translation. But it, for those of you who read Chinese, the original text is displayed right here, so you can follow along as I as I read it out loud. Okay, so diary of a madman. I sincerely appreciate my own heart. By chance, I sit down with you, face to face. All you can say is one word: tomorrow. Now we both suffer in such solitude, and such sorrows in the blink of an eye. In fact, is not that important? Like a distant childhood, or a tranquil romantic moment, we dreamt of every kind of thing, facing an autumn of dreary dreams, seeing vitality in dried leaves, or start, starting to talk and breaking the silence. To portray the story's lead role for you, only until the most difficult time passes by can we learn to distort the definition of life. Years go by without giving promises. With all our might, we established valueless spiritual wealth in a transparent <coughs> backdrop, layer by layer. Each wraps up his own package. Of course. There can be many beautiful times as this. What else is as monotonous as your own thoughts, blossoming, blossoming like the flowers of silence in the darkness, quietly whispering. Night is such a very melodramatic flavor. Let me reminisce. Yet no matter how impure this night is, or after tonight, we both, we will both. Witness betrayal of each other tomorrow. Wind bellows and rustles the leaves. Meandering path, paths lead to shadowy places. That storm must have dampened the flowers and catkins. I believe, perhaps, before too long, we shall all regret. We shall all regret 
like the wind which, parting toward all directions, always return, always will return again to today. Once and once more, crushing the remaining few things in our hearts like the sound of a blossoming flower, quietly finishing all its actions. Beautiful. <laughs> An excellent timing. Okay. Uh, so I think our next presentation uh, is uh, by Fred. Okay. <coughs> and you can have uh, 12 minutes. Okay. You can have 12 minutes, yes. So, kind of switching directions from poetry now to in the classroom, how to teach students. <laughs> um, so, my name is Fred, and uh, over the last semester I conducted a research project with the help of Sun Lao and uh, three of our classmates in our teaching Chinese class. The research project was focusing on uh, how to teach Chinese character, characters to beginners. Um, Chinese characters to beginners pose a, kind of a big problem because they're very complex, and if the teacher focuses too much on the characters, then the speaking and listening skills are going to lag behind. If the teacher doesn't fo focus enough on the characters, then the character recognition also tends to lag behind. So, <clears throat> there's been a lot of problems. So, first, before we get into that, we need to look at what does it mean to learn a character? Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing that students need to develop is an orthographic awareness, which is to say the visual shape of the characters. And that's basically the same, what's the difference between 100 and white? There's one stroke, right? Uh, this typically takes about four months, or within four months. Some students do it quicker, quicker within a month, others it takes longer. This is also to say that you know some characters have three parts to it, and some have four parts to it. Being able to recognize these different parts is the first step. Um, after that, they need to recognize strokes and stroke orders. I mean, most of you guys have been in the Chinese classroom, so you understand the struggles of this. And that each character has has a, a specific amount of strokes and a specific order to be written in. Um, after this, they need to know what are the different types of characters. The reason that this is important is because in different types of characters, the phonetic component, the components, or the radicals, have different functions. So the most common type of character is a phonetic compound, which is comprised of a semantic radical or and a phonetic radical. So in this character, we have the semantic radical, woman, tells us that this character has to do with a woman. And then we have the phonetic radical, ma, which tells us that how, how to pronounce the actual character. But now, in a pictogram, or in an ideogram, we also have radicals, but they don't have the same function as they do in a phonetic compound. So in an ideogram, we have two radicals, which are two tree radicals, and two tree radicals together gives us the idea of a forest, right? So it's not a phonetic radical and a, and a semantic radical. Or in a pictogram, it's actually a picture of an idea. So here we have a picture of a kiosk, which tells us that this is going to be a shop, right? Now, after they have, uh, they know the types of characters. The last thing is they need to develop radical knowledge, right? And radical knowledge is just to say the function and location of the radicals, right? So here we have a heart radical, but the heart radical is in three different places and it has different forms. So in the first character, the heart radical is kind of you know, squished. And then it comes into its regular form in the second two. But the heart radical, although it's on the left side, in the middle, and on the bottom, it still has the same function. And so this is also important for learners to know to be able to become good readers of Chinese. Also, with the phonetic radicals, learners need to learn that phonetic radicals do not give do not give exact representations of the sound. So here the phonetic radical is ding, but it's pronounced da, ding, ding, right? So it doesn't give us an, a consistent cue of how to pronounce the words. So now that we know that I mean, right here we kind of see that characters are hard to learn, right? But what also makes characters hard to learn is to be able to reproduce characters and to remember the exact stroke order and to recall it from memory is very cognitively demanding for new learners and for advanced learners as well, I'm sure. Also, as I mentioned before, these semantic cues are not always reliable. So here we have a silk rattle, yeah, and we can imagine that silk is used to tie a knot, right? So this is kind of easy. But for get eight, the silk radical, what does that have to do with give? You could say that you give silk as a gift, but this is kind of a stretch, right? It doesn't have a direct relationship to the radical. So 
<coughs> now that we know that characters are hard to learn, what are some of the what does the research suggest that we should do for novice learners? The first thing we have the focus on peeing, focus on writing, and the focus on recognition. What does this mean? Focus on peeing. This group says that we don't teach characters in the first semester or maybe even the first year, right? All we teach is peeing. Now, the idea behind this is that if we develop our oral skills first, our oral proficiency, when we go to read, it'll actually help us learn to read. So, if you're reading a sentence, "Wojing Chang Chu Gong Yan Bar," maybe you don't know. Chomp, you don't recognize the character Chomp, but if you see the sentence and you recognize the pattern of the sentence, you might be able to guess what the character is. So by developing your oral proficiency, it will help when you're going to read. It also help you map on the phonetic sounds onto the characters. Um, people have argued against the folks on peeing because they say that, well, once my students learn how to speak, they don't want to go back and learn characters. Why do I have to relearn all of this stuff? It's very frustrating. They feel like they're doing the same work twice, right? Um, also, Actually, that's mainly it. Moving on to the focus on writing. <laughs> there are a lot of neurological studies that have proven that by writing characters, it actually facilitates your recognition of the characters as well. Um, part of this is because of motor memory. Uh, by writing, you, you create a motor, motor memory uh, connection to the characters and to the word, so it facilitates recollection. The problem that people have with the focus on writing, writing uh, method is that it takes too much time. Uh, for learners to go home and to write 100 characters every day, it's just not efficient, right? All right. And then the last group that we have is a focus on recognition. Now, the focus on recognition, this uh, basically started from a guy named Alan, Alan in about 2008. And what he was saying is that for handwriting, uh, handwriting Chinese is not really useful for us learners because we never have to write Chinese, unless you're in school. Right now, you guys are in school, so you are having to handwrite some things. But once you go out into China, almost everything is done via word processing or typing on your phone. So why do we need to know how to write characters, right? Um, and by not writing characters, the folks on recognition group claims that they can teach Chinese characters much faster because you don't have to be able to reproduce it really quickly, right? Now, the arguments against this is that, number one, we don't know what the long-term effects of only focusing on recognition for learning characters are. And the other problem is that there are a lot of people who would like to make the claim that learning to write characters is culturally significant to learning Chinese, saying that you know it's a big part of the culture the calligraphy. Um, <clears throat> so our research question, um, when we went into this, we acknowledged the fact that focus on peeing, focus on uh, writing, and focus on recognition, they're all very valuable. The research supports it. We recognize that the research supports it. But what does it look like when we put this into the classroom? When you go into the classroom, you have student expectations, you have teacher expectations, and you have time constraints. And when you have all these constraints onto your class, do you still produce the same effects? Does writing still help if you only have 50 minutes to learn in a class? Does peeing still help when your parents or your administration is demanding that you learn characters, right? So, we, for our research, what we did is we had three instructional methods. And for our three instructional methods, we had a, a focus on peeing method, a focus on writing method, and a focus on recognition method. We had nine participants that were divided evenly between the three instructional methods. And then for each group, we gave them four 30-minute sessions. Upon the completion of the four 30-minute sessions, we gave them an oral assessment and a uh, character recognition uh, test to see how these students would compare in these three instructional methods. Um, next, what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite up the teachers, because we had, I didn't teach these sessions. I designed the classes, but Justin, um, <coughs> Heidi, and Tisha, they taught the methods for. So they're going to explain what they did in, their, in each of their sessions, and then we're going to look at the results. Mm -hmm. So first, I'd like to invite Heidi Sisney up to tell us what she did in the Focus on Peening group. All right. Um, my group focused only on peening, so in our classroom we didn't use characters at all. Um, basically, the way that my class was arranged, like all of them, we taught the students um, some emotions, we taught them some numbers and things like this. And so we gave them slides and it would have pictures on them. Um, and in my class, we tried to focus a lot on speaking and listening. And so, um, when possible, we'd, I would speak to the class in Chinese or I would explain through pictures um, and actions and when they didn't know, I was able to speak to them in English. And so because our method only focused on peening and we didn't do characters at all, we had a lot of time in order to be able to do a lot of repetition. So our students had a lot of time for activities that they did between them. They practiced a lot with each other and with me and I was able to um, correct them a lot on like bad pronunciation and things like, oh, like, incorrect pronunciation and things like that um, and so that we could teach them. So 
So they were able to learn through that method. But they had they had peening. We didn't spend a lot of time formally teaching peening, but they had time to like at least recognize it. And for those of you who don't know, peening is basically just an alphabet system that correlates with the way that Chinese sounds. And so they can kind of guess based on peening that they saw on the slides in that sign teaching method. For our next, we had a um, Tisha Edwards who taught the focus on writing groups. So I taught the focus on writing group, and at the beginning of class we would review the previous lesson's characters, and then we would jump into the new vocabulary, and it would be on PowerPoint, and I would point to the word, and I'd say it, and then I'd use pantomime to help the students guess what the word meant. Then after we went through all of the vocabulary, we practiced on writing. So I wrote each character stroke by stroke so the characters, so students could see how it was written and they would practice with me. And as I wrote the characters, I counted the strokes in Chinese so the students would know how many strokes each character had. And then I explained the characters to them. I, I told them what the phonetic components were, what the radical was, and if there were any radicals that we'd already seen, I pointed that out. And so we spent a lot of time working on characters. So there wasn't much time to work on speaking. There was actually very little time by the time we got done with the characters just because it took so long. So that was my method. Okay. And our last one was Justin, who talked to focus on recognition. You can refer up there, but we focused on recognition. So we had, what I did, we had a PowerPoint, and it had like the character of a word on there. And what I did is I spoke Chinese the whole time, and I pantomimed and gave example sentences until the students understood what the character was. There was no pinyin, pinyin. Um, no English, just the character. Um, and so in this way, we hope to be able to help them hear. There are three things, really, to recognize the listening, to be able to recognize what it sounded like, um, and then to be able to speak it out loud themselves, and also to be able to connect the Chinese word with like its English meaning. Um, and so we reviewed it, we had like a handout and a quiz, and um, it helped them to be able to like connect Chinese with English together. And that was basically the recognition process that we went through. <laughs> and one more thing, in the focus on recognition group, what we did is that uh, before each speaking activity, students were required to connect characters to pinyin. This way, by not having the characters and pinyin together, it actually forced the students to focus on the character and try to recognize it, rather than just giving them pinyin and characters. Because we all, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for everybody, but me as a learner, when I was presented with characters and pinyin, my eyes went straight to the pinyin. Mm -hmm. unless I was forced to look at the characters. And so by doing things to separate these apart and forcing you to make a connection, that's what we were trying to look for in the recognition group. So for our overall assessment, we uh, had 12 questions, and for each question they were graded on 12 constructs. So for the uh, five constructs, <laughs> five constructs, <laughs> fluency, word choice, grammar, pronunciation, comprehension, they got a three if they and gave a perfect answer, they got a two if they had one or two errors, and they had a one if they had three or more errors. Um, for our oral assessment, what we found is that the focus on pinyin group and the focus on recognition group performed almost identical. So even though the focus on recognition group had to work with characters, they could still perform orally just as well as the focus on pinyin group. While the focus on writing group lags behind. Now this was undoubtedly because of the amount of time that was given to the students to practice their speaking skills. Because uh, in the focus on writing group, they just the time was taken up by writing activities. For the character recognition, we took all 50 characters that they had learned in the four sessions, put it on a piece of paper, and they had to write the English for each of the words. What we found is that the focus on uh, writing and the focus on recognition group, they performed much better than the focus on peeing groups, suggesting that through focus on peeing, you cannot, students do not learn characters incidentally. However, the focus on writing group did perform slightly better. They got 30 correct out of 50, whereas the focus on recognition group only got 24. However, with the focus on recognition group, we only spent about five minutes on characters in the 30-minute session. We could have easily added one more focus on recognition exercise, which might have, in, might have increased their score to be equal with the focus on writing. Um, so we're kind of running out of time, so, and we also have the student perceptions. But I was told I'd get an extra five minutes. Really? <laughs> 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 
first we have uh, the students' perceptions of the of the uh, methodology, which I'd like to bring up our teachers one more time. So for the student perceptions on P, what do they think? Um, so overall, my students really liked the method. They gained confidence really fast in their speaking and listening. And I noticed that from day one, they were able to not only repeat what I was saying, but have meaningful conversations and know what they were saying. Um, but the students also did notice that they weren't learning any characters. They got to the first quiz and they said, I can't fill this out and would often leave it blank. Um, and so that was probably the kind of what was left behind there because of our focus on reading and writing. And then our focus on writing group. <laughs> so the students enjoyed learning characters, but they didn't care at all about stroke order. So it was really interesting watching them write because they all wrote it wrong. <laughs> Even though I taught them, it's like, okay, this stroke, then this stroke, then this stroke. And they also had a hard time separating the different parts of the characters out. So while they could recognize the character, they didn't really know different parts. I mean, there, there was one radical they remembered, but the rest they totally forgot. All right, and the last one, our folks on recognition. Uh, all the students love to be able to speak. They also love being able to, like, hear and recognize the characters, and they all performed quite well, except for being able to write the character itself. Um, so overall, the students and myself as the teacher had a lot of fun um, learning Chinese, and it was actually quite like productive um, that way. They even came up with their own like pinyin and stuff. Um, and <laughs> when they had to write the characters, they just did it their own way, and it worked that way, you know. But I feel it was quite a success in the way. Mm -hmm. uh, last night, conclusion. So, thank you. Last thing that we found, um, basically, this was a very short study. It was only four sessions with only nine students, so obviously we would like to have ten sessions with 30, 40, 50, 60 students, and more the better. But what we found in the study is that a focus on recognition is more efficient for novice learners, for beginner learners. Not forcing them to produce characters allows them to focus on other language skills that may be more important to first-year learners. And we said, we're not saying that get rid of writing altogether, but maybe writing should just be left for homework and not be done in classrooms. So that classroom time can be used to focus on communicative skills or possibly leaving writing until the second year, and then the second year we can develop writing skills more. Mm -hmm. and that is it. You. Enlightening. Very good timing also. Okay. And amazing collaborative project. Okay. Thank you for sharing with us. Um, yeah, I would like now, since we have, uh, I, w I have asked for some extra time, so we actually have 20 minutes for uh, Q&A, and I would like to invite all presenters to come to the front of the of the room, and I would, uh, floor is open for audience uh, audience to ask their thoughts, what they have experienced, what challenges they have encountered in uh, tackling their uh, research and translation projects. Okay. Um, all right. Floor is open. Questions? Yeah. I've had a question. Uh, a couple of things. Are you familiar with the uh, Hasek's mnemonic method, method for learning characters? Have you ever heard of him? Uh, it sounds very familiar. Okay. I was just curious because that, that's another method that wasn't one of those methods. I was. Oh, maybe I'll talk to you about it after. It, it would be like the mnemonic method. It would be to fall underneath the recognition because in all the folks on recognition, what you would do is you have partners work together and they talk about the different ways that they that they that they make sense of the characters. Right. So with the, the chia, they go, oh, you see, like, it's, it's a, the silk or chia. Well, the, the silk, so, like, she's tying a knot, like, she's tying a knot around his husband, that's why they're getting married, right? So, right, this would kind of fall underneath that category. Yeah, so the, one, the one comment I had on the recognition method is that it kind of presupposes that everybody learns with visual and audio cues, but yeah. what about mm -hmm. aesthetic mm -hmm. memory, which I, I for personally consider a, a valuable tool, and my own personal experience, I studied Japanese first, and they saved mm -hmm. characters to very, very long, late, and I didn't mm -hmm. learn very many characters. But in comparison, Chinese introduced characters early on, and I learned yeah. a lot more characters than I mm -hmm. So that's just my own personal experience. Mm -hmm. And I would agree with that, but I would say that, for because right now we have so many tools and so much technology that we can make worksheets that teach you stroke orders that can be done outside of the classroom for kinesthetic learners. But the classroom time is just so limited and so mm -hmm. valuable. Yeah. No, I think that's your most valid point, is that, yeah, I think in the classroom is less important to focus on the characters than outside. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Okay. More? More questions? 
Okay, I'm going to throw in a very big question. Uh, I would like to invite uh, each presenter to talk about two challenges that you have tackled with and the strategies that you have used to try to synthesize in your either translation or research projects. Okay. 好，从杜伯特开始吧。Uh, one of the challenges that I had is in that first poem that I read, um, the Da Feng Yi Huang Chan Su. It's the um, there it is. The, the, this phrase here. I don't know if you can see the pointer. This phrase here, Yi <laughs> Mian. Um, that that one was kind of difficult to translate for me, partially because、um, in the Chinese it comes at the front of the sentence, whereas because of English grammar I can't really put it at the front of the translation, and so I had to come up with a way to give it the same. Force that、mm-hmm. the that the Chinese version means.、Mm-hmm. It's, it's like another you know,、like、repetition, and it's like literally like in your face.、And、so、mm-hmm. that's why I went with in my face. <laughs> Except you'll notice on the the third line, even though the third line in Chinese starts with yin yan, the it, the third line I I couldn't I didn't feel that the like saying that the mountain hues are in your face quite made as much sense. I, I felt like it, the, the the picture that I the mental image I wanted people to have was like it's before you, like it's like spreading out in front of you, like the scenic kind of view.、Um, so that that was one of my challenges with with that poem.、Um, down here, the there, this、um, the second poem, Bridge.、Um, it, there's a couple sections that were kind of challenging because the, the the concepts. Don't really have a, an equivalent in, in, in English. Like the, the, our lives also cast their dark souls. In, in the original Chinese it,、um, talks about a shadow,、mm-hmm. and, and I did kind of try and in, indicate that later on in the English. But the, the Chinese phrase didn't really like. If I did a direct translation, wouldn't reflect fully what like a, an English person would want to, to capture、mm-hmm. from it. So I had to come up with something that that would give the right emotional response, and that's why I said that they cast their dark souls. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, those are my personal challenges. Any questions? So,、uh, a couple of challenges. Just with poetry, I feel like、uh, it, it's kind of I, I think like the person who's talking and the audience is kind of assumed in a, in a lot of、um, situations. So, at least. You know, for for me, when I was looking at at these poems, to, I had to kind of see like it, it would just kind of say maybe、um, a general, like a general sentence, and I would kind of have to think like, who is the audience here? Who is he talking about, or who is he talking to? And is this just like himself that he's saying this general sentence, or is this like he's saying for everybody it should be this way? So that was difficult, but I, I, you just kind of had to read through it and kind of ask yourself,、uh, kind of like, yeah, just what what is the message that he's trying to get across here?、Mm-hmm. Um, also, just yeah, there's certain imagery, like certain、uh, phrases that don't translate directly、mm-hmm. into English, and so it's kind of a, a question of, well, do I? Just kind of put it in any ways, just because that's the culture, or and that's important to to portray. Or do I change, you know, the the translation so that it、um, is more expressed better in English?、Mm-hmm. Um, I, I guess those are probably the two challenges I, I face the most with poetry. And、uh, in the end, I guess it's just it's up to the translator.、Mm-hmm. It's、uh, you know, kind of which method he chooses to translate. If he chooses to be more、um, kind of letter of the law, or or try to translate the emotion of, of、mm-hmm. the piece,、mm-hmm. any questions? We can all give it to him, and then see if there's interlap, interlap, interlapping. Ah, but our time is possible. Ah, we're in good timing. Good. Next one. Okay, so、um, probably two things that I found were most difficult.、Um, so I translated the story of Rapunzel, and In Chinese, there's the spoken language and then there's the formal language. And、um, I spend I speak all the time with my friends in Chinese, and so I'm very used to just formal, just to, to colloquial speaking. 
um, and sometimes it's it's pretty easy for me to translate something, but I'm not sure if that's the correct form. If that's the formal way, if I want it to be more formal, if I want it to be more casual. So those two differences, um, I always rely, I usually go and re- rely on a local that speaks Chinese very well, and they, they can uh, give me those um, suggestions. The other thing I think that presents a challenge for me is onomatopoeias. Um, they're uh, like, um, this, like onomatopoeias are the sound that like snip snap or um, ding dong <laughs> or um, I know ji ji ja ja is like when a lot of people are talking. It. You know, there's just like they have different sounds than we than English speakers have for different sounds. So. Um, coming across a sound like in a, in a story, it's uh, it's like how, how do you do that? <laughs> so I also go to a local for that. But, yeah. Excellent point. Okay. I see you. Two of my problems I had was um, when with dialogues. And when we speak English, we have a lot of like expressions that don't. You know, if you translate it straight across, it doesn't make any sense. One of them was um, earlier in the movie. It talks. There's this guy warning to watch out for the for the people because there's a lot of vultures around. Like talking about that they're bad people are going to take advantage of them. But if you say vulture in Chinese, it doesn't give that same. <laughs> and so I end up translating to like, old fox is what they say. It's a similar saying. And then the the one line that I had the hardest time was uh, the very end of the scene where he says, "Here's looking to you, kid." <laughs> I, was, I, I don't even know what that means in English, to be honest. It was some, if, you, if you think about it in English, there's things we say that we don't know what they mean, we feel what they mean. And so I, I, know I asked tons of people, can you explain what this means to you? And it, basically everyone gave me very different answers, but they're all romantic. And so I just picked something that was young, mm-hmm. it's like never forget, but it's very romantic thing. So that was my challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, part of it is just like coming across like some of those sayings I kind of faced in like my story of grandpa of the yeah, grandpa's tale, you know. Um, so that was kind of one of the struggles as well. Another one was like the grammar structure. Mm-hmm. Um, just like when you say one thing in Chinese, it's really hard to like figure out how to say that reversed in English and stuff. And so that was one problem that I uh, ran into. And so I went to a native speaker and just yeah. Able to talk, talk through and yeah. figure out yeah. how that would actually like come about. So, mm-hmm. those are my challenges. Mm-hmm. Top red. <laughs> <laughs> finding participants. Finding participants. <laughs> teaching, teaching the, the finding participants would be number one. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Oh. Um, as far as like the theoretical part of that, there weren't too many difficulties. I've kind of known what I wanted to do for a while. Right. It's just a matter of collecting the data. And most of it was just actually carrying out the study. Um, yeah, I don't know too. There wasn't too many glaring difficulties mm-hmm. I can think of. So. Mm-hmm. Important questions. Okay, we all we all encounter those moments, right? Heidi. Well, I have a question. I think it was you who brought it up. Okay. Um, you were talking about translating different things and whether you were going to translate it, like for exact meaning or for kind of what it was based upon. Like, what did you decide to do? I, I didn't catch what you said. Well, I feel like it, just, it depends on on what you're translating. But for the piece that the poem that I translated, I I think. There was a, a good mix, but generally I kind of tried to, to stick with like a more exact meaning mm-hmm. um, to the point that it at least made s- some sense in English. Like you lost some artistic quality to keep meaning. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Um, but just because I felt like that helped to keep the like cultural, <coughs> like to portray that kind of cultural yeah. um, aspect, because I feel like if, you, if you're reading a poem that you know is translated from Chinese, you probably don't expect it to sound exactly like an English poem. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel like there might be phrases that sound different to you, but that's kind of, it's, it's a Chinese poem. It's supposed to be different. The culture is completely different, so it's supposed to be that way. So I feel like for this piece, I tried to stay more on that end for that reason, but um, it just depends on the piece. 有一句话在那首诗里是曲径悠悠那个非常难翻就是meandering uh, path uh, supposed to be very romantic 但是就是说你很难很难把握那个度 how to, how to deliver it 
the image with the same uh, cultural uh, cultural implication or uh, or how to invite similar audience response through translation. That is very difficult. Very difficult. Okay, Tisha, do you want to add some? No, we <laughs> are Okay, uh, our audience. Um, Response Q and A questions. Question. Okay. Um, were you able to find a translation of Casablanca done by somebody else and yes. able to compare your translation? I was. Yeah, that's where I got you to know, one. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> there, figured out. So. Mm -hmm. But yeah, some of them were pretty close, and some of them caused way off. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was just my grammatical problems. Do 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 do. How? Other questions? No, I think no questions. Oh yeah, yeah. How? Yeah, just a question about the translation. Was there any part where you guys found like I really understand the concept behind this, but I can't deliver it in English in any way? So I felt like more than <laughs> When when I did that, um, you kind of just think of what you just uh, go with the whatever comes to your mind, really. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> okay. sometimes like. Sometimes the translation doesn't quite fit, but it's like just to kind of help transition. I feel transition things do sometimes have to be put in there um, in order to make things actually fit for the cross in language and culture and stuff. So sometimes that's appropriate. Sometimes it probably shouldn't be done, but it does get done. <laughs> so that's kind of what I did. Okay, others responding to the yeah, similar question. I, I, don't do that. I think a lot of times that happens, at least for me, translating from Chinese to English. Because it's Chinese, you're like, oh, I get it. But how would I say that in English? <laughs> yeah. But if you go revert the other way, you go English to Chinese, a lot of times you can dumb down the language quite a bit and go real simple. <laughs> you can go from English to a really simple version in Chinese, and then yeah. you can build it up. Whereas you don't have that build foundation and you can build it down to English if that makes sense. Uh -huh. So you feel like as well for me it's like with all his lines like all the gin joints in all the world that line I thought it sounds so cool in English but then when you flip it to Chinese it really just sounds like it's pretty basic he's just telling you something simple so it doesn't sound as classy. <laughs> I feel like if you want to be an effective translator I don't know if this is true or not but like <clears throat> just like living the way we build up a culture in our own lives, um, wherever you're from, going to the opposite culture and living there, I feel can really help you understand the culture and the language. So if you want to be an effective translator, uh, it would be appropriate to like go <laughs> and actually live in the place you know, for a long period of time. Really build up your your self. You know, the your intimacy. The yeah. 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 Uh -huh. More? I, I have another question. Okay. Um, I feel like poetry is such a culturally relative uh, linguistic commodity. Like, I wonder if you poetry translators do you think that translated poetry is still poetry, or like if you were a poet, would you allow your poetry to be translated? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I think it, I, I think as far as it being a poet, it kind of depends on on your situation. I think it, the ideal situation is for the poet to work with the translator mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that it gets the, the best mm -hmm. version that the, trans, the, the both the translator and the poet are happy with. Or the poet's translated himself. Yeah, <laughs> if they can. Um, I, I, you know, I, with, uh, with poetry, I think one of the things is that you, you, you have to be a little bit more free with it when, with translation than maybe with certain other topics. Um, and that's kind of what we've been learning the whole semester was kind of to balance between literal translation and more free translation. Yeah. Yeah. And it's definitely poetry is one of those areas where, in order to really get the same emotional response from your reader, you have to be a little more free with it, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just adding to that, uh, I, I mean, I think when you really think about poetry, like what that is, I mean, it's you know, it's it's expressing human emotions mm -hmm. or, or feelings or maybe you know imagery, um, but I feel like those like very basic concepts are. Um, you know, they, they cross all cultural bar barriers. I mean, everybody on the face of the, the planet has emotion and, and, you know, they experience things and they feel things and they can see things and describe things. And so I feel that, I mean, even though a lot of times that, that cultural barrier can make it seem like you just can't, you know, translate the, what this poem is trying to express in the end, like that basic 
thing is something that is um, uh, able, like everyone is able to experience. So I feel like, I mean, just because of that, like we should try to, to translate it if we can, you know, um, just because we're, we're all the same, we're all people. How much time do we have? Uh, we have uh, we have five more minutes. Really? Yeah. Um, so uh, just to resonate with that, uh, the the concept, uh, the the what the Joshua just mentioned, is um, this universal universal shared feeling, right? Mm-hmm. Which, uh, in other words, it means the ability to empathize with the other, right? <laughs> so that's that's why we translate because we want to share similar uh, or. Uh, shareable experiences with other other people, right? People from other cultural communities. Okay, yeah. I, I really like this, actually. I'm getting all excited about it now. Um, <laughs> something I really find interesting is that in Chinese, the family, you have a name for like each family member. English, you don't. You have like cousin. Um, in Chinese, you have like older cousin, younger cousin, boy <laughs> older cousin, you know. What I find very unique is that like cultures are unique, um, and that's kind of the purpose. Like that's why people want to keep culture there because it's not found anywhere else. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's kind of an important part in translating. Is sometimes something will not translate, um, mm-hmm. and that's supposed to be there. Like in order to truly understand or feel that emotion, you have to go and get it in the original context. That's why it's so hard though, because like um, we're you know everyone. Is so different, and we cannot um, experience every person's experiences. Everyone can have their own experiences. For instance, in your in your chosen text, it's about uh, it's about China in the early 20th century, where you know rural areas bandits uh, are rampant, and you have to resituate yourself into that historical context, which is very challenging, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. I'd like to add what Justin was saying. You know, part of the reason translation is so important is because all these different cultures in the world. They are unique, and they can each contribute something to just the global community and to individuals. Um, you know, if, if we if we all felt that our own culture had everything we needed, then what would be the point of exploring other cultures? And I think that everyone knows that there's differences between China, between uh, America, and that they both have valid points of view. And mm-hmm. translation is taking the original <coughs> and translating it through the cultural lens so that it can be equally understood by both sides. Excellent. My, uh, I'm going to ask one question. If there is, uh, I'm going to ask the question about the title of our panel because it's translating and teaching Chinese, and the panel itself has an interdisciplinary um, nature. And I want to invite um, for the feedback um, how this panel could be could come back into your future practice, either learning Chinese or teaching Chinese. What what insights can you take away from this panel? One or two things. For, for myself, something that I really, uh, I feel like, have, that has been, like, emphasized is that as, as a translator, uh, you're not just translating, like, the words from English language to Chinese language, but you're, like, the cultural translator as well. You're translating that Chinese culture to, to Western culture or vice versa. Huh. And there are times, like, where you have to, 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 to decide, do I want to translate this? cultural aspect into a different cultural aspect or do I want to to leave it there so as to emphasize the cultural differences and um, I mean like I said like we've talked about before it's it's different for everything that you're translating but I think that's the main thing that stuck out to me is that it's not just language that you're translating it's culture too I don't know more Fred. <laughs> okay, so much. Yeah. Uh, okay, perfect. Uh, I think this is one of the most, uh, one of the most well, uh, how to say, uh, well, uh, micro, micro management panel. Uh, each person have been done really very, very good job. Amazing, amazing. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you very much, and thank you our audience for your uh, for your uh, attendance and support and questions. Okay. Presenters, I'm going to invite you to stay for stay up for a group picture, and also we are going to have a short ceremony of uh, distributing your certificates. Okay. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you.
我们还有我们还有一分钟时间。Okay. 